Now well, here we are, beginning of the week. It's a Monday, the 28th of October. <clears throat> it's in the afternoon. <laughs> oh, kind of a relaxing day today. I'd kick back and we just talk like, uh, like we know something. <laughs> Uh, in reality, uh, I was looking over, you know, I make a lot of different uh, comments about things I see out there on the internet and most of the time I try to tell it like it is. Actually what I do is I, I uh, talk about how I see it and uh, most of the time it's just my opinion. Sometimes I'll repeat uh, somebody else's uh, because it correlates what I'm thinking at the time or it's actually what I believe at the time. So most of the time, if you see me on here, it's it's really just me. I'm not putting on a bunch of airs. And most of you that follow my channel, you know that uh, this is, a, for me, this, it's non-paid. It, it, uh, I get nothing out of this thing other than it's just my hobby. <laughs> I get a kick out of uh, how many people think that I get kicked out here to the garage. <clears throat> if you look around my garage, you can see in here, uh, it's it's my hobby shop. That old clunker back there, I mess around with it. I, the only reason I really have it is because my wife likes to drive it. It's a small pickup. and I do have a bigger pickup right outside the door there that uh, that I take out occasionally when I feel like it. That's all. <clears throat> For the most part, I live a pretty uh, moderate life. <laughs> uh, the wild times are way behind me. And there may not be all that many wild times behind me anyway. Um, uh, I'm kind of a, a fairly quiet guy in, in most times. Uh, as far as uh, that old truck back there, it's almost like a pet. <laughs> uh, whenever I feel like doing something to, uh, to uh, enhance the mechanical part, I just, I do it. Uh, it does have, oh, fairly new brakes on it, new tires, uh, uh, oil change, filter change, been lubed. Uh, I worked on the uh, four-wheel drive on it. I had to do some rewiring on one of the solenoids. Uh, let's see, what else have I done to it? The interior didn't, when I got it, the interior was in pretty good shape, so I really haven't done anything with it. There's no custom work to it. Uh, before I bought it, the guy had uh, ditched it, and <clears throat> it bubbled the, one of the fenders just a little bit. It wasn't much, but uh, there was, I noticed there was uh, oh, some links put on it. I'm trying to think what else. I still need to uh, attach the lighting, trailer lighting back there. It's kind of hanging down. I haven't uh, lost it yet, but <laughs> I will if I don't pick it up pretty soon. I hardly ever drive it too far. I mean, there's a small town not too far away I drive it to there once in a while and back and when we have to haul a few things but that's it uh, the other truck uh, it's a little bit bigger and uh, it drives kind of nice it's uh, a Cadillac EXT uh, pickup it looks like the Chevy Avalanche and uh, it's just one of those things I always wanted and you know, when you're retired, that's when you buy all these toys. <laughs> so, I don't drive it much. <laughs> it, uh, and it's not bad on gas. I get around, uh, oh, anywhere from 15 to about 18 miles a gallon, which isn't bad. I mean, the darn thing weighs around 6,000 pounds. So, you know, it's a little on the heavy side. And uh, like the rest of my vehicles, they're, you know, we always keep new tires, and I just put brakes on it, uh, I think about four months ago. You may have seen it when I was doing a video. I, I probably had it parked in here for 
Oh, usually a few days. That way I can uh, always vacuum the interior and clean the windows and things like that when I work on the car. So when it rolls out of here, it's kind of detailed. Uh, this one here, sometime this winter, I'll probably go ahead and uh, paint it. It's been with those primer spots for, <laughs> I think, five years. <laughs> There's no reason to get in a hurry. I'm, you know, it's not like I bought it to resell it or something like that. It's, it's, it's just like a mascot, I guess you could say. I kind of get a kick sometimes. Uh, I look at some of the comments out there. And uh, <laughs> uh, some of them, I noticed the other day, uh, uh, they seem to think my Nickname was so that I could appear more manly. <laughs> I, I guess I've never really worried about that too much. <laughs> but you know, uh, people make all kinds of decisions about things, and other people try to change the real meanings or whatever it is about it. It, it has to do with the job I did. It has nothing to do with anything else. <laughs> <laughs> but then, you know what, imaginations, they make the world interesting, don't they? Uh, I'm not saying the people that misjudge it ha <laughs> have an interesting world, but they have a mind that might be interesting if we ever had to de deconstruct it and try to put it back together. <laughs> I don't know if we could get it back together any better than it is now. It's kind of a squirreled setup, isn't it? <laughs> but beyond that, let's, you know, it, People are what they are, that's all. You gotta be happy with yourself and move on. That's kind of one of the things I learned over the years. Uh, but I don't know, if you took everything personal that you see out there, you'd probably, who knows, have a mental issue or a mental breakdown. You know, uh, a lot of people out there, and, and they do, I'm not trying to belittle somebody that has problems like that. Uh, far be it. Our, our country really doesn't have a lot of facilities out there to help people that do have problems. Is probably one of the reasons we have so many people on the street. And uh, I think it's a shame the country that is that has as much money as we do can't get the people off the street. And uh, every time I see these big expenses, expenses or monies uh, go to another country. And, you know, I really wonder why we're doing some of it. Uh, I'm not in the, obviously I'm not in their seat uh, making those decisions, but uh, it seems like my money could be very better spent in, in a lot of cases. Um, you know, years ago when I was uh, young, uh, the taxes were a lot less and it seemed like things were going a lot better. And I don't know if it's more taxes that we pay, the, the less we get out of it, or just what's going on, but it, it sure seems to follow a pattern. The more that goes in, the less we have coming back to us. And I, the observation I get is, as the taxes raise, the federal checks raise. You know, the, the amount of people that are working for the government and I'm wondering when will it be the day that we all just get a federal check and we are the government. And I think back then and I say, well, there's a little island that actually fits that. It's called Cuba. And in the 50s, uh, that uh, little island off the coast of Florida there, it had a lot of the high rollers uh, in it. You know, they were, it was quite a tourist uh, island, and it was known for its sugar cane, believe it or not. They they were probably one of the main suppliers of our sugar here in the United States. <clears throat> and uh, a dictator came along, his name was Castro, and he wanted to make it equal there in that country, and in fact, he, he pretty much has. And, uh, you know, the educational process and the uh, medical and uh, things like that 
everybody is given a, a pretty decent education and they're taken care of medically as far as what the finances will carry through. The unfortunate thing is that it, there's not a lot of money. I, I think the average person, believe it or not, I think it's somewhere around $20 a month is what they actually have for their income. And I realize that everything out there is based on what money that a country may have. Uh, and the, you know, the, the most of the cars are pretty well, they're old cars. And I would say that the condition isn't the greatest on them. The, the people must be really mechanically uh, inclined because when you think that uh, a big share of them are from the 50s, uh, you, you realize how much poverty probably is in that country. You know, it, and some of the main parts of Cuba where tourists are coming in don't look too bad, but you only have to go a few blocks away from a, a main part where you get into the buildings that are falling down and, you know, the fronts haven't been redone in 40 years or better. I mean, it, maybe, maybe longer than that. Uh, you really get to see what happens when somebody comes along and says, we're going to equal everything out for you. Uh, and and I, I, I'll give an example. It, right now, our country as a whole, we're spending more than we take in as a country. So if we were under a socialist government at the rate we're going very quickly we would be broken we would be living like that little island called Cuba now I don't know what's keeping us afloat quite frankly because when your debt goes as fast as what ours is at the present time the day comes where it comes to a halt now you've already seen what happens when money is printed and there's nothing really backing it uh, when there's more outgo than in go you might say inflation sets in and uh, the only way you can kind of slow it down is you have to raise the, the interest rates and stuff and that kind of slows down major purposes you know major purchases but major purchases in this country are homes and cars the American dream two cars in every drive and a boat and, <laughs> and uh, a house and maybe even a cottage somewhere for, on a lake but those dreams are slowly disappearing for us and and for us to get back in hand we really need to be a united country again and it doesn't really matter I don't think so much the party as it is the man that you put in place. So now it's a matter of how can we get people that know how to handle money into uh, our Senate and Congress. And those two bodies decide how we're going to spend our money. It used to be the people of the United States did, us, the citizens. But it really isn't so much anymore. Because most of us, I believe, uh, maybe I'm out of touch, but when we look out there on a regular basis on TV and we see the homeless and the drug addiction and the mental uh, decline in our populace without adequate help, uh, how do you feel about that? Because we're not spending a lot of money trying to pick that up and cure it. We're not trying to prevent it. <clears throat> we, if it was a fire, it would be like letting a prairie fire go till it burned its way out and it went right on across the country and there was nothing left at the end. I'm not so sure that would be a good idea. No. You have to have fire breaks in there. The fire breaks I put it, we put in there for the mental 
instrumental institutions that are adequately uh, personnel would be in there to take care of those that need that treatment. <clears throat> a lot of people come back, from, you know, we've, I've noticed in the last 20 years in particular, we, we send our young men into other countries and, and they're subject to uh, maybe not as much hand-to-hand -hand combat as we'd have in a war itself, but there's the worry all the time of attacks. Uh, you know, these, these uh, rockets and missiles that come in on you, uh, they disrupt your, your mental facilities for you so that you can't, uh, it's hard to explain it, but the psych gets disrupted, your whole psych. And then if we bring them back here and we don't have the facilities to take care of them, we may end up with more and more of our vets on the street. And once they're on the street, you know, they're not recognizable anymore. Families don't want anything to do with them. They don't go out looking for them to try to bring them home. The government doesn't want any part of it because they don't want to spend the money. They have so many pet projects. You know, if you get, there is a, there's a state <laughs> along the Mississippi that, that has an airport that hardly anybody uses, that Congress sends them somewhere around a million dollars a year to set there that was a pet project for one of their senators way back years ago. Kind of like a gift. There's a bridge up in Maine that really goes into Canada but it isn't really something that goes anywhere in real terms. Somebody told me there's even one in Alaska similar to that, that it really isn't utilized. It's just built to be built because somebody had a pet project that was in our Senate or Congress. And each state has something similar to that. It's not, you know, people that, that work in those offices, they want to bring something back so they can pat yourself on the back and get you to vote for them next time. But when you look at it, they're pork projects. That's what they are, pork. And you're paying for something that, and you're getting no real value back for it. And they say, well, it's not a big deal because what the heck. <laughs> it's not much money compared to the, the budget. But when we add up all those people and all those pork projects, and we think of what we could do for it, could we feed the hungry? in our own country? Could we take care of the mental instability in our country? Could we regulate and control the border in our country? See, we're doing all those things for other countries right now. This type of thinking goes down to even small towns. And when you go through them, and you may see in this little town a great big brick structure in the middle of the town, and a nice square around it. Maybe a couple old cannons sitting there for, uh, you know, just to be able to look at them. And there'll be a memorial of some kind sitting out there. And people from years ago built those when there was hardly any money at all. They took pride in their town. They took pride in their people. And they took care of the citizens in their little town. So nowadays, it's hard to put that kind of money together to even think about doing structures like that. So now when we come into those same little towns and you have buildings that are run down, if they catch on fire, there's a charcoal building sitting there for a long time before they can do anything with it. <clears throat> and somebody's always going to take care of it. But they can't. Because they don't have the money. Small town America is just about wiped off the map. And yet you can't afford to live in a big city. 
the food costs more. If you want a place to live, that costs a lot more. If you take and move out into the suburbs, your little satellites out there, bedroom communities, you have to drive back and forth. And yet, right now, it'll cost you twice as much to drive the same amount of miles with a car that's not as dependable. Today's car has a motor probably that would last 20, 30 years, easy. But the electronics usually are gone within 50,000 miles or five years. Now, don't, you don't have to take my word for it. <laughs> Just Google it. Say, how, how long is the, fly, you know, the average car lasting right now? How, what about the electronics? Now, you know, 10 years ago or so, they were starting to put out some of these EV vehicles. And those same vehicles today are worth zero. They have batteries in them that are just about wore out. And if they end up at the junkyard, they look nice. And you'd be tempted to go ahead and give them a couple thousand for it and bring it home. So you think, well, gee, all I've got to do is replace some of the cells in that battery and it'll be like brand new. <laughs> and you'd be right. And it's not that hard of a job. I mean, once you remove that battery out of there, you can very easily get in there and remove those cells and start replacing them. But then you got to put it all back together and get it back on the road, except for one thing. How long are those old cells going to last that are there? You got a battery that's 10 years old. I got news for you, the balance of them aren't worth a darn. So the new battery is gonna cost you more than the original car did. It's also gonna cost you a lot more than you're gonna get out of that car if you sold it the next day. You could drive it, more things go wrong with it. So what do you do? These are all things that were, I, I would say it was getting the cart before the horse. And if I was to ask you to do anything at all, it would be try to use common sense when we allow these people to make these decisions for us, telling us what's best for us. Because with a certainty, they didn't know. Now, in my earlier years, I worked in different places. It's, uh, one of my first jobs was for a company that uh, made appliances. And uh, I was in the, the drafting department. And I ended up doing like the sales, uh, the ink sales, the drawings for the, that they put out for ad advertisement. I did ink drawings. And then I did the electrical schematics for the equipment for the, you know, that goes on the back. You have this little placard on there. And then it's also in the instructions for should somebody ever decide to work on it if they repaired it someday. In another company, I ended up as a uh, automation designer and a tool designer. And I liked it. I liked doing that. <laughs> and quite frankly, I, you know, the professor that had taught me some of the different classes that I took when I first got out of service had said, always remember KISS. Keep it simple, stupid. It meant to keep something as simple as you can so it can be worked on. And our engineering, you know, back in the 50s, just about anybody could fix it, and it would run on about any type of fuel. And if you had bailing wire and some tape, you probably could keep it running. <laughs> and I know I'm, 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 I'm stretching it a little bit, aren't I? But in real terms, the parts were easily fixed and repaired and, you know, I, I <laughs> the one time this friend of mine, I was out there uh, helping him combine beans with an old, one of those old belt combines pulled behind a, an F-20, you know, it's <laughs> today you could, you couldn't do it today. But anyway, the gearing had started snapping and popping and so <laughs> we took that thing out and we started welding the gears up and then grinding them down so they would work a little bit. It used to be on something like that, they were so loose anyway that you could get in there and you could do that a few times and, and finish the season out. It, you honestly could do that with equipment. 
like I say, it was repairable with a little bit of ingenuity and a couple of tools. It didn't take much. And in today's society, you have a car or a vehicle, and uh, they give you all these modern conveniences in it, but uh, you're not going to be able to fix it. For one thing, you don't have the stuff to analyze it. Now, I've got a little thing like that, and it's about that thick. And I can hook it up on that truck over there, and it'll give me an idea of what's going on. And it'll say, well, you know, the circuit's bad or whatever. You may have a half a dozen little modules in there. Yeah. Unless you've worked on that vehicle and experienced uh, those similarities of what's going on, it's hard to diagnose which one might be bad and you really don't have the equipment to test each one. And sometimes they work for a few minutes till they get warm. That's when they kick out. So you, <clears throat> and it's a domino effect in there. One operates another, and <laughs> you know, almost like a pyramid. <clears throat> but we've got our life complicated. And sometimes I wonder why our government let things run amok like that. They tell us it's so that we can clean the world up. We want to have an atmosphere that we can breathe in. And when I look out there, and I'll give an example. There was a stream when I was a kid that was just, it was, I don't know, 75 yards maybe. It was less than a football field from my door, from the door of my house that I grew up in to get there. And the water was clear, and it was considered a bass stream. And it had a lot of bass in it. It had bullheads and things like that too in it, and carp and suckers and you know bluegills, and pumpkin seeds. Um, it, it had a, quite a variety. And we could go down there and we could feed our family off from that. Believe it or not, yeah, I, and almost year round you could, you know, you go ice ice fishing down there and catch plenty. Now I don't remember there was no crappies in it that I remember, but it, we had plenty of good eating fish out of there. Today, it's a wasteland. People wanted to build on different places along the areas it would flood in the spring. And before you know it, people with money wanted to develop you know, places where they could put 50 or 60 homes. So one of the first things that went was the dam. <laughs> so now it don't flood there like it did it floods downstream at the next place. Worse than it ever did. Get the water right away. The fields around there were all tiled into that thing. You know, because back in the 50s, you didn't see much tile. They had wetlands. Uh, you just farmed around them and uh, did the best you could. Your bottom ground very seldom had to have fertilizer put back on it. It was very rich soil from it. Yet he put a crop in there that didn't take as long. It might be beans. Could be a sorghum crop. I mean, it, it was a matter of choosing something that fit the land. And it worked very well. But you know, the colleges today had taught how to, well, you just, where your fence row might be, the fence is gone and you've expanded it that extra three feet, your field. And now you have extra income. And as you got more land, you had to have bigger equipment. It cost more money. And then, if you didn't have a balanced farm with animals on it, you had to buy your fertilizer to put back on the ground. And you didn't have to worry about rotating the crop anymore because you're going to use chemical fertilizers. Why would you need it? Well, if you walk out in that same field, like when I was a kid, I could reach down grab dirt out of the ground and it would, you know, was moist to crumble my hand and there was all kinds of little worms and bugs in that ground. Today you can't grab it because there's a hard shell on it. It's about an eighth of an inch thick most of the time and it's hard like this tabletop. So you gotta have special equipment to break it up. You gotta get that seed to get up there before you can get a shell back on it. You don't want too many rains, it'll get a hard shell on there and then it has a hard time sprouting. 
<clears throat> it's a science today to farm. It takes special equipment. A tractor cost more than a whole farm did when I was a kid. That's saying a lot. It was hard work when I was a kid trying to make a farm go. My, my grandfather sold his, and then my great-grandfather from the other side of the family, he had sold his and moved in right across from where I lived when I was a kid. And I, a lot of times I'd wish that those farms weren't sold, that we could have used them in the family, but if you don't grow the farm, you can't afford the equipment to put crops in or take them back out. And I remember when the first transitions come in to where they were, the cultivators were getting a little more size to them. And so the people would buy them and then they did custom uh, work out there for the smaller farmer. They would go out there and, uh, you know, do the combining that needed to be done out there and the picking. And they would get their little piece of action. That way even a small farmer could have a crop out there and do pretty well. Today's farm is so specialized. And the equipment barely fits down the road. If you meet somebody with a corn head on there or uh, the combine, and I don't care how you, you try to get around them, you can't. You, either they have to pull off or you're going to pull off. The farms themselves, they've had to level them more and more so that they can use this equipment because you get 30 feet ahead out there ahead of you, you know, be, you know, on the sides and stuff. This thing is doing this. And the more it moves, the more times you have breakdowns. And it wears out a lot anyway. Have you ever tried to drag something through the dirt? You get an idea. I mean, you take a knife and you take two swipes in the dirt and it loses its edge immediately. So your farm equipment does the same thing, whether it's a disc or whatever you're going to be using to cut the ground open a little bit. And uh, even if you're knifing in liquid fertilizer, you're out there changing things on a continued basis. Our confinements, you know, where we raise hundreds of hogs in a building, and people say, well, that's, that's cruel. And, I gotta go along with it. It, it. it is for the animal. It's cruel. And it creates a biohazard in the area around that building as well. But they are sanitized and uh, for the most part it, they're probably a, a very healthy animal. Maybe more so than what you would have bought years ago where they you know, could free range in a field. But the farms around where I lived they, they would let the hogs and the cattle out in after they'd combined it or picked it. And there was enough on the ground that they would go out there and they would eat that off the ground and at the same time they were fertilizing it for you. <laughs> and you always had a lot where they were at in between seasons there where there was plenty of fertilizer there and you would scoop it up sometimes by hand and sometimes you had a tractor that would do it. I've scooped a lot of hog houses out in my day, in my younger years. <clears throat> There's guys that have farms today that are under 20 acres. They're for the family only. And they raise some chickens and some hogs, but rarely raise cattle because it's a lot of work. And uh, the return isn't as great, but you can do it. And they will go out there and they every square inch is used in some manner. And each farm has different areas where they'll grow a different crop better. And for the most part, it, it turns into a vegetable farm. And one of my grandma grandparents, that's what he had was a vegetable farm, a pretty big one back then. And he had a natural spring right down through the, the farm that water came out year round. <clears throat> And he was able to utilize that to keep his crops properly watered when he had to. A lot of hard work, though. Today, we seem to be worried about the hard work, so we're willing to pay more for equipment that doesn't take require that. But then, in the last 10 years, we've got equipment out there that are all computerized, operated off of a satellite. 
takes a lot more money. You got to you almost have to have a college education to even run this equipment now. And the manufacturers have hid most of the specs on it. They don't want you to be able to work on it. You have to hire a dealer, such as John Deere. Dealer will have somebody there that knows how to read the analytics on it and repair it if need be. And then they try to get the parts if they can. So you can imagine if you have one of these big pieces of equipment sitting in the middle of your field and it's waiting for parts or waiting for a mechanic. It used to be the only thing you had to worry about was, are you gonna need more rain or less rain? It, it's changed. More worries, harder to do. And by the way, right now you can buy corn for less than $4 a bushel. Soybeans are under $10. Now you get, my understanding is you can get anywhere between, let's say 210 bushel to about 240 bushels, maybe 250 bushels per acre back of corn. And back when I was a kid, you were lucky to get 100, but they, they were further apart. The rows were wider. So that had a lot to do with it. Beans haven't changed a whole heck of a lot. And we used to rotate the crops so that the bean crop would put a little more nitrogen back in the soil. So every so many years it was beans or corn or whatever you're gonna do. We're losing the knowledge of those old farms. Years ago when my kids were small, we lived in a different small town, different state than what I live in. And there was an old farmer out there that he was one of the last that really had a, a completely balanced farm. And he, you know, he, he didn't go in debt, he didn't borrow money. For the most part, he had his own seed. <laughs> and no, nothing was hybrid out there. And he raised cattle, I mean, people, they wanted something that was raised on his land. It didn't matter what it was, pork, chicken, uh, a steer. <laughs> Uh, or a heifer, I mean, either one. I mean, it was, he had a good reputation for good products. And no, he didn't raise vegetables for everybody because like, you know, he, had, he was raising corn and, and beans and, and livestock. And pretty much it was self-subsistent. He, he could feed his animals, and his animals fertilized the ground. And the ground was easy to plow. And no, it didn't harden after a rain. It was very easy to get into it. You could take a spade and go down a foot without a problem at all. It was, the soil was loose. And I would like to see you try that on most farm fields today. Now I didn't get too far off the subject, but I just wanted to give you an example of what modern technology has done to us in this country. And you know, some of those older countries, you go way back in them, they don't have all this modern technology and they still do things by hand and their ground is still good and they still have good crops. It's just not a lot of money. It's just hard work. I don't know if we'll ever get back to people raising a lot of their own gardens and things like that again. It's hard to tell. I mean, I think that's gone. Kind of like us old timers, we're just about gone too. You know, With us, people my age, the technology of the old times are going to be gone. And you'll get a, some sort of a, a uh, history lesson on it, that probably about a 10 minute lesson, telling you how them old timers <laughs> did things so stupid. Because <laughs> anybody knows you got you to pour the chemicals on the ground, you got to break it up good, break the clods up so you can, the so seed works. <laughs> My, my grandparents and great grandparents, it was hard for them to get the farms going because they had to remove, you know, shrubs and trees and things like that to be able to put a crop in. And acre by acre, year by year, they expanded their farms into what they had. But they didn't lose sight of being able to maintain the farm. They, uh, they, they took care of the land and the land took care of them. Today, we're so busy poisoning it with the poisons that kill all the bugs and uh, gets rid of everything that might 
kill the defoliation on a plant, that the field, when you walk on to it, when it's finally planting time, the field, the, the field is sanitized. There's nothing living out there. The bugs are gone, the birds are gone, the animals are gone, there's nothing. When they go to plant, it is a field that is sanitized. That's it. Doesn't smell like it used to. It doesn't feel like it did. And the crops coming off from it don't taste the same. If you noticed, I don't know if you're old enough to understand this, but the tomatoes that today are bland compared to what they used to be. Now, if you happen to get some from a foreign land, and they'll warn you, you got to watch out for salmonella and things like that because you know, animals, fertile, they, they pee on the stuff out there in the ground. <laughs> you got to wash it. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, but it, it, it tastes like it was supposed to years ago. Now your, your hybrids, I don't care what you do with it, they're not going to have the same taste. Now the, the, the food that's out there in a lot of these markets looks better than it did when I was a kid. Because we had little spots on them and wrinkles and stuff like that. But we could pick it up and you could smell it and you could touch it. You could tell if it was ripe or you could tell if it was rotten. Today it's pretty hard because it has very little smell to it. And most of them will be bruised a little bit, but you don't know it because you don't see it. it. Even when they finally rot out, they rot out from the inside out, and you don't see it on the skin until it's too late. I've noticed that a lot of tomatoes I get, the seeds in them look like they're sprouting inside the tomato, and they're green on the inside. And it has to do with the heat and cold that they're subject to before they get, and the age before they get to you. The bananas get rotten within a couple of days. You know, if you pick things green enough, it'll never really ripen. It never gets the sugar content that it would be natural to it. But then in this day and age, who cares? You just take a tablespoon of sugar and put it on it and, and you over sweeten it. And it doesn't taste like the fruit that it was. It tastes like sugar. Like that's what you put on it. That's what you wanted to taste. And I know it sounds like I'm griping, and, and maybe I am a little bit. It's just memories that I'm looking at from way back when. And it, it probably is a little boring, but I wanted you to understand what it was kind of like back when I grew up. When we could walk down the block and somebody say, hey, you want a tomato? You walk out in the garden, they hand you a tomato, and, and they might even hand you a salt shaker. <laughs> You sit right there and or stand right there, or well, even sit, and uh, eat your tomato and you talk a little bit, because that was the reason they called you over for, so they'd have somebody to talk to. They were out there working the garden. It might be a tree full of peaches, and apples. Uh, if you're down south far enough, you might be some permission, permissions, permission. <laughs> uh, the older I get. Anyway. There's so darn many things that uh, this generation is missing. And it always brings a smile to the, somebody my age because we didn't miss any of that stuff. We miss it, we miss it now. <laughs> and even the ground, I mean, you know, I've got a pretty nice place here. It's about a half acre. And I've had a couple of gardens in here, but the, the soil, when the house was built and the house has been there now, well, right around 40 years, I guess. I think it was like 18, 17, 18 years old when I bought it. But the ground, they put the bad soil on top, and apparently they'd pulled a lot of the black soil, good soil, off from it. And so it's hard to tell where the top layer ended up around here. But a good share of mine is, is clay. And uh, it's got, you know, over the years, because of the grass and trees and things, back and forth, it's built up a little bit of soil, but not, not enough to put in a decent uh, garden. And I had, I've had a couple spots that I was able to get something halfway decent, but then the seeds, 
weren't that great. These hybrid seeds don't work as well as the natural seeds and the taste still is good. The really last garden that I was able to have was probably oh, really over 30 years ago where I planted it and uh, the crop was really good. It was good virgin soil. Might be a little less than that. I, it hasn't been ma that many years ago. Man, I, I can't remember where it was at, but I bought property uh, just adjacent to a, a field, you know, a farmer's field. Matter of fact, the farmer just lived a little ways, you know, down the road from me. And uh, the person that uh, had owned the place before I did it threw out, you know, the, the gourds and things like that out there. And uh, apparently uh, they grew wild. <laughs> Hard to believe. But anyway, I put a, the, the guy told me the best place to put a garden in there where he noticed one before. And so I got, got it all tilled up and, and put and it was great. It, I, hands down great. Yeah, but then the surprise was over this other part and it was I put up a garage as well there. Behind where that was, uh, it was just kind of a wild area there. I hadn't done much with it. And uh, I happened to notice these plants <laughs> growing through there and, and all of a sudden and here's these uh, different squash and stuff growing up in there. And uh, they actually matured back there in that, you know, mainly a weed patch, but they were pretty good. So <laughs> that became part of the garden after that was to, to do things like that. And there was no willow tree out there that I took uh, down. And that helped quite a bit too because there was more moisture in the ground once I took it out. And I'm, it was a big, <laughs> it was a big tree. But there's just little things that you have to do to get there. Where I'm at right here, I could, I could get the soil mended back into something that would grow. But I'd almost have to uh, try to get some uh, seeds that uh, are from years ago. And, and they're available different places, but believe it or not. <laughs> but then, is it worth it? <laughs> because by the time I could get them all put together, would I still be here? I don't know. It's it's uh, getting about that time of the of the cycle where uh, I'm gonna be shaking hands with uh, the good Lord one of these days, <laughs> and uh, whatever I I could plant a garden out there and maybe not be able to reap it a few months from now. Who knows? But anyway, that's just that's neither here nor there. That's just one of those things. I hope I didn't bore you too bad today, and uh, maybe we can figure out something with a little more kick in it uh, next time. At least uh, I'll, f I'll get a little idea. If, and it might be people like me that remember those days and appreciated it. You know, the farmers uh, back when when I grew up seemed to be a different uh, type of people. That, I mean, they were all hard workers, don't get me wrong. It, they uh, were fairly friendly when they if they knew you. It, it, now, we always kept friends with as many as we could because we bought a lot of products from them. And uh, we hunted the grounds that uh, my grandfather, well, both grandparents, great-grandparents and stuff, uh, had lived not all that far but out in the country on their farms. And, and so most of them knew us one way or the other. So we, we had a lot of places we could go back then. I've been away from it so long the last place I can think of that was on, that would even be tillable, that belonged to one of my aunt and uncles, was sold to somebody outside of the family five or six years ago. So anything that we may have hunted at one time or fished or done anything with, it's all gone. It, there wasn't enough interest uh, family-wise to keep this stuff going. Um, it's it just the way of the world, I guess. Uh, the towns were more lucrative. You could have money in your pocket. And now we're kind of going the other way, where if you move closer to the convenience of a factory or something like that, it costs so much money that 
there's not going to be a whole lot left over. You know, California has one of the highest incomes in the United States and the highest amount of people on the street, percentage-wise. It seems to go hand in hand. The more the opportunities, the more discrepancy there is in the amounts that are made because one is the class that's making the higher amounts of money than the management, and the other one is the service class. And service class uh, people, uh, such as your fast food workers, your restaurants, your tavern, they get the bare minimum uh, for wages that can be paid out there. And even though, and it, a lot of it's because it takes less of an education. It just takes a person to show up for work and do the duties that are prescribed to them. And they have to drive the, usually, well, they can't afford a place there in town. So what are they going to do? They have to either drive or share rides or something. And we don't have public transportation today like what existed in some of the cities and small towns. Uh, this little town that I was in at one time actually had an electric trolley in it, and, and it was a very small town. But it was not too far from a, a good-sized town. And they always had a bus service and plenty of taxis and things like that. And everything was reasonable. You didn't have to own a car. And there was very few people where there was more than one car in the family. So uh, a changing world. More money, more things, uh, more entertainment. Uh, even though there's more entertainment, I think it's less fun. <laughs> I, I, at least for somebody like me, it, there's, there's less uh, fun and stuff like that. But then uh, it doesn't take a lot to keep me occupied anyway. So I guess maybe it's not a bad trade-off. The house I picked, I picked, you know, this is all country behind me on this side and on that side up there. And this is uh, small town residences around like this. But when you look out, it looks like a, a forest looking out like this. It's uh, There's trees back here that are, Oh, probably 70, 80 feet. Uh, they're way up in the air. Uh, my backyard, I actually have one that's about 40 or 50, 60, something like that. And there's a couple out here I planted over 20 years ago, and they're they're getting up there. I mean, they're slow goers. Uh, I think the one here is maybe 40, 45 feet. I, and I've got a few years ago I put some. Uh, kind of like evergreens to ring part of this here. It's mainly it, uh, for privacy. They'll get up there probably between 12 and 20 feet, let's say, eventually. Uh, I don't think in my, my years, but they're, they've already grown a, a few feet out there. And, uh, I even I, I put a evergreen. I'll never see it grow to the end, but it's it's one of those uh, evergreens that has white tips on it. It's really pretty. Uh, we just enjoy seeing it. And I've got a couple of cherry trees here that are uh, uh, 20 years old, 21 years old, right, right outside on my garage here. I used to have some peach trees back here, and uh, they got taken out one winter, and then. Oh, I forget what I planted in here, but the tornado took them out about 10 years ago. It was over here and wasn't being over here, I guess. You never know what's going to happen. <laughs> it just happens. In the front, I've got a tree that's been out there since. Uh, it was one of the few that was here when I bought the place. And uh, it's up there pretty good. I, I got a notice from the power company they'll be out here trimming it because it's getting close to some lines out there. But the neighbors, a lot of these, um, they, they're older homes going right here. And uh, they all have about a half acre. One guy over there's got an acre and a half or two acres. The guy up there is, I don't know, he's got quite a few. I don't know exactly how many he's got. And the guy over here, he's got an acre and a half. And it's all farms beyond that. Beautiful. And I can walk out and see farms. Walk out this way, it looks like a park, a beautiful park. And that's why we, my wife and I got, we have a nice deck out here. We, we can sit on it, sits up high. 
uh, our pup can run. We put a privacy fence around part of the property so that we don't have to worry when we let him out. He has a ball <laughs> chasing squirrels and rabbits and everything else. That's my, that's my kingdom, my utopia. So with that, I'm going to call it a day and uh, hope you enjoy it. If you get bored, uh, <laughs> just click on it. <laughs> if you're my age and you have some memories, put them down there in the comments. Maybe we can talk about some of them old times. And uh, for all you guys that appreciated my song the other day, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> oh, yeah, years ago, most of, my, most of my sang were uh, like Hank Williams. And, uh, <laughs> you know, that, that era was uh, pretty popular when I was really young. And uh, the, the songs that I learned, in, you know, when I was in school uh, were nothing like the uh, songs of today, that's for sure. Not that they're not some pretty good songs out there. It's just, you know, a different style. That's all. <laughs> when rock and roll come along, I mean, it, uh, it really rocked our socks off. And matter of fact, what we had was we called them sock hops. And <laughs> most of the time, we'd have dances in, in the basements of the different kids that went to school with us. That was pretty neat back then. And then uh, we had a couple ballrooms that we could go to. They weren't too far away. And uh, believe it or not, uh, this little town, or not a little town, pretty good sized town, uh, they had a bandstand nine. And uh, when I was in high school, a wrestler, the team got to go there, uh, the cheerleaders and the wrestlers, uh, to uh, dance on the on their uh, invitation by the TV station. They had their own bandstand night, similar to uh, Dick Clark's bandstand night. It was pretty neat and kind of fun. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to let you go. You have a great day, and uh, maybe I'll see you in the next day or two on here. Who knows? <laughs>